Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Today our subject is firearms and their safety. We have read recently about a number of cases here in the Pacific Northwest where there have been tragedies with children, for example, getting a hold of firearms and one child shooting another one. Uh, it's very important in how we deal with that safety issue and we have a very qualified guest to help parents uh, deal with firearms and to engage in sports and so forth, but also to protect uh, family members. Our guest is Robert B. Smith, who is employed with the Spokane Fire Department and he presently is assigned to the Paramedic Squad 10. Our guest has a two-year certificate on fire science technology he is uh, registered with the National Registry and Washington State Certified Paramedic. For the National Rifle Association, he is certified as Defense Pistol Instructor, and he's also a graduate of the Lethal Force Institute Advanced Lethal Threat Management. Bob, I've known you for some time, and we're very happy to finally be able to do a program, and I know we can help our citizens with um, the use of safety and uh, firearms, and also there are people who don't know how to use firearms that want to learn. and I know you're very involved in that. My very first question to you is, although I've given some of the background, would you share with the viewers uh, what all you do in working with firearms and some of the organizations that you're involved with? I know you have a club here in North mm -hmm. Idaho. I'd be happy to, Tony. It's uh, my pleasure to be here, not just on the show, but it's always uh, a bonus, I think, to be able to uh, share on as broad a forum as possible safety issues such as this. Uh, uh, my background, in addition to being a paramedic uh, with the fire department, uh, I've been involved in emergency services for 20 years. Uh, that includes uh, civilian uh, works as far as uh, firearms training. I also work with police officers, uh, security officers, that type of thing. Uh, in addition to uh, the department, I have my own company that uh, deals specifically in training civilians and uh, police officers in what we call countervailing use of deadly force. That is defensive application of firearms. Uh, I'm also director of a nonprofit corporation uh, here in Coeur d'Alene uh, called Fernand Rod and Gun Club. And uh, the uh, main thrust of that organization is an educational basis and providing a safe facility for people to go out and use their firearms in a uh, safe and responsible manner. I, I know that you have both classes and you also work with individuals. I mean, you could work in a lot of different uh, combinations. Absolutely. You know? uh, in addition to uh, my goal as an instructor was to try and reach as many people as possible with this type of training. We offer a, uh, either what I do commercially through my school or uh, as an NRA volunteer instructor, uh, and I'm also a staff instructor with uh, Spokane Falls Community College on this subject. Uh, so we offer a number of different programs uh, through whatever medium we can uh, do that. As far as uh, children and training of that type of thing, uh, we just did one, as a matter of fact, uh, through uh, SFCC and uh, in cooperation with the local gun club in Spokane. And uh, one of the things that brought this about was uh, the type of shooting you're talking about we unfortunately recently had here in Coeur d'Alene. Um, these things are very tragic like most instances of this type are avoidable. Uh, I think the number one thing that perhaps a parent or anyone else out there could remember is that any accident with any type of equipment can happen to them or their children. In the 20 years uh, that I've been working with this type of thing, the recurring comment I hear is, I didn't think it could happen to me. And that is whether it be a heart attack or a drowning or an accident with an automobile or a gun or whatever. And the first thing to address is that yes, it can, and as far as firearms, if you're going to have and possess firearms, and that's a personal decision uh, that each individual may make for themselves, but if they choose to do that, uh, the motto that I have that I use particularly with my school is they have a right to do that. They have a right to own a firearm, but they have a responsibility to use it safely and wisely. Uh, as far as safe care and storage, there's a number of things we can discuss as we that's progress good. along sure. on that subject. Surely. Uh, let's go a little bit into depth of, of how you uh, deal with different kinds of uh, trainings. And I'm going to get into specifics on safety and, and also for people who mm -hmm. feel the need for a gun for protection but have not uh, had one. We'll go through all those processes. But let's start with the class. When you're doing a, a group of individuals rather than a one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, do you have different kind of classes or, or do you just have a, one basic kind of course? No, actually we have a variety of classes, Tony. Um, in my school we offer two levels of training, uh, what I consider a basic and an intermediate training. 
And uh, from that context, those classes are geared specifically for defensive application of firearms, uh, most commonly handguns. Uh, that's what uh, most uh, civilians and the average police officer is using as their defensive uh, uh, firearm. Uh, the two levels, just instead of trying to explain the basic uh, classes themselves, let me give you an analogy that I like to use as a paramedic uh, from the medical community. Uh, we treat the use of a firearm in that context, a, a uh, uh, defensive tool, as analogous to any other life safety rescue tool, uh, analogous to a first aid kit or a fire extinguisher. Uh, it's designed not to necessarily make you one of those professionals in the civilian context, but to hold the line until the professionals can arrive. Um, just as a person may go out and buy a fire extinguisher, no one is attempting to make them a firefighter when they do so. Uh, they bought that as a tool to hold the line perhaps until they can exit the house or whatever and the firemen come and you know put out the fire hopefully. Uh, when we send someone through a CPR class, and I do uh, CPR and first aid training also uh, in the medical sense, uh, we're not trying to make them a paramedic. We're trying to give them the skills to hopefully sustain a life until the professionals can arrive. And when a person chooses to buy a gun with the type of training we do, we're not trying to make them a police officer but we're trying to give them the uh, knowledge and skills to maintain against a criminal assault until the professionals can arrive in that context also. Okay. Uh, basically what we have then is two classes. One that you might consider a basic first aid class. Mm -hmm. That's the basic level training for a person with little or no experience with firearms. And we have an intermediate class that you might consider going to like EMT or maybe paramedic school in a mm -hmm. similar context. It's, just, it's more advanced. Than in depth. Much more advanced than the first level. Uh, one is a one day class, the other is a two day class. Okay, so, and you do those on a, on just a regular basis when there's a demand for those? Uh, we teach every month. We For the last six years, we've had classes every month for the last six years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the good fortune here in Coeur d'Alene to operate uh, uh, both on an outdoor range and an indoor facility. Um, we use a club facility for outdoor during the summer, and in the inclement weather, we have a commercial range which we use here in Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Let's now talk about, since you've worked with so many different kinds of people, uh, how you do it when you're doing, instead of a class, you're mm -hmm. doing it with an individual. Are you trying to meet that particular in individual's level of need or experience? What we'll do with that, and invariably what I have when I do an individual class, uh, all of our students, of course, because of the nature of the training, uh, there's strict confidentiality as far as the, the clients go. Uh, they're very security conscious people, and many of them, due to the nature of their positions in the community and whatnot, would not like advertised um, that they choose to have a gun around the house or perhaps even carry one. Mm -hmm. and of course, all these citizens are doing so lawfully uh, with the proper permits and whatnot that we train. Um, the individual who comes in on, on an individual, a one-on-one -on -one basis, normally is one who doesn't even want the association with another group. Uh, the maximum students we take is 10 in a group class. Some of our uh, students have chosen, because of confidentiality and privacy, to take one-on-one -on -one training uh, simply for keeping it basically uh, on a low key. Uh, we have a large amount of professional people, uh, physicians, attorneys, uh, those type of individuals taking classes, as well as uh, the average housewife or just couple uh, that wanted uh, you know, that same type of training. Mm -hmm. Just depends kind of on the individual, what they so desire. Yes. Let's then talk about some of the needs that people have or, or interest. Uh, could you take us through uh, some of the average families that you'd work with? Uh, what are the different interests that they have in guns and firearms? Actually, that's really something that's interesting, uh, and I think it kind of uh, destroys the stereotype that many of us may have about uh, people and guns per se. Uh, there really isn't any set type of individual. Uh, in the six years we've been training, and that includes you know privately through the school, through the community college, through the gun clubs, and whatnot, as a volunteer instructor, uh, we have a, a people from about every walk of life and every background you can imagine. I've had people through the training, for instance, like we recently did it for the children, uh, who the parents did not even own guns. They did not even possess guns in their homes. But they came to the class to get the education and training so that if, in fact, their child came up against one, perhaps in a neighbor's home or something of that nature, their children would know how to deal with it. Um, so we've gone from people who would, would be what you consider uh, perhaps gun enthusiasts or the classic quote-unquote gun nut, the person has a large collection or whatnot, uh, to actually people who have not even, uh, or have no interest in even owning a firearm, but just wish to be informed about them. Mm -hmm. 
we've spent a lot of time already on the program talking about firearms in relation to protecting oneself mm -hmm. or having safety in the home. But I know that there are people who have guns that they collect, uh, just a hobby with them, and they have some very expensive collections. Mm -hmm. I also th know that there would be some that would be involved in sports. They have, you know, shooting clubs, contests, mm -hmm. and, and of course there are people that are hunters. And mm -hmm. Can you just kind of take us through a little more in-depth uh, interest that those individuals have? Sure. Uh, there's a cross-section, again, as you mentioned there. You have folks that are just collectors, and uh, matter of fact, some of these people collect guns as uh, an art object or an investment type of thing. Some of these guns are never even fired. They remain in a box or a display case or something, and from the day they came from, uh, not in this case, not usually a factory, but it's originally a, a factory gun, which has been, uh, you know, uh, engraved or modified in some manner artistically, these guns are never even fired. It would destroy the collector value of them. You have uh, collectors who just enjoy going out and shooting, and that may be a family, may be uh, either member of the uh, husband, wife, or whatnot. Um, you have the hunting enthusiast. Um, we're trying uh, either through directly through my school or through our club to reach all these people as far as uh, the safety issues. Uh, one of the things, for instance, that uh, we've been involved with the club with these people is to offer some place they can safely shoot and offer training up there so that we don't have repeats of accidents such as we had last year uh, uh, here in Idaho with a couple mistaken for a bear. Mm -hmm. uh, the young uh, girl that was recently shot, uh, Hopefully we can avoid those type of things. I, you know, I must be completely frank. These things will never stop any more than drownings or heart attacks or other things will, will stop. Um, I talked to another uh, show right after the incident with the little girl that was shot, and they asked me a, a question on that. Well, can we ever stop this completely? And I said, we can reduce it, minimize it through education. But in fact, it will not stop. Just And I gave an example of drowning, for instance. And four hours later, I was on duty that day, Four hours after that uh, taping, I was on a drowning pulling out a you know, young man out of the river who I'm sure did not go to the river expecting to drown either. It's tragic, we'll never stop all these things, but we certainly can minimize them. And firearms deaths specifically, uh, particularly accidental, have been on a decline since the 60s. And part of that's because of the training on safety. And Absolutely, probably uh, you know, the, the, a number of groups are responsible. There's private in individuals like myself, but probably I'd say one of the uh, premier groups has been the National Rifle Association's training programs with their volunteer instructors, of, of which I'm also one. Um, in between the hunter programs, uh, safety programs for children, uh, law enforcement training, they're one of the premier groups, and we really feel that that educational aspect has uh, reduced all types of shooting accidents uh, significantly over the years. I want to spend some time on the safety question mm -hmm. uh, because you certainly are qualified in that area. We hear uh, uh, almost every year during the hunting season. Of course, that's a l very large area that's covered, and a lot of people are out there. It's like the more people are in automobiles, more likely there's to be an accident. Absolutely. And I understand that. But there are tragic deaths in hunting where someone is uh, mistaken. And uh, could you take us through that process since we'll be getting to the hunting season before too long? Absolutely. Would you give advice to people who are going to be hunting this year? How could they prevent that kind of tragedy? What are some of the tips that you would give them? You bet. I think the number one thing, and um, and this is some of the things that we're going to be offering through our club up here uh, in conjunction with the uh, Idaho Fish and Game Department on hunter safety programs, uh, who would probably be in this state their premier organization for training people on the hunter safety program. I would say some of the number one tips, Tony, is to be familiar with the firearm they're using to absolutely identify their target. And by being proficient, I mean they should be going to a range, not leave the gun in the closet. It comes out once a year to go hunting. They don't even fire it until they get out of field. That gun should be taken out to uh, a range somewhere and practice with so that the hunter feels confident and proficient with it. Uh, the number one thing, once, just like on the range, once he's a field, he must absolutely identify any target that he expects Never to shoot Never shooting at anything moving absolutely. that he can't identify. No, no uh, sound shots, brush shots, this type of nonsense is totally irresponsible. Matter of fact, in my opinion, it's criminally irresponsible. Um, the person that goes out must when he's carrying a firearm, always uh, exert what we call muzzle control. He must always know where the barrel, the business end of that gun is pointed. His finger should be outside the trigger guard. I'm not happy with just off the trigger. I believe it should be outside the trigger guard until the time that he has identified the target, in this case a game animal or whatnot. He's identified the target. He's made sure he can make the shot and the finger should not get inside the trigger guard until he is on target and ready to fire and he is aware of not just his backstop, 
In other words, where the bullet may go if he misses or perhaps pass through the deer or whatnot. But in addition to that, what is around him? Uh, in other words, do not be so excited and so intent on the deer that you don't see a fellow hunter or another person pass in front of you. So it's not just where your bullet may go, but what is between you and the target as well. If a person exercises those safety concerns, uh, at the very least, if he does mess up, we may hopefully have minimal property damage, but no bodily injury or death. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, clothing is very important. I know there's been mm -hmm. a lot of emphasis on how you should dress when mm -hmm. you're hunting. Uh, there's a variety of different studies on that, and um, there, one thing that's be going on in different states is the hunter orange uh, type of thing. Um, I'm be, I'll be honest with you, I'm not personally a proponent of that um, because I, I, I'll be honest with you, I used to have the attitude if they can't see me, they can't shoot me. That's a terrible thing to take, but uh, so I quite frankly used to wear camouflage as when I bow hunt, I wear it during the regular season, the muzzle loading, whatever. But I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion that because we do have that element out there that makes the sound shots and uh, I'm hesitant to even move or say hello to someone for fear of that, I think that can be educated. I'm a firm believer in educate versus regulate. Uh, so I hate to see things like that mandated. Mm -hmm. I would much rather see people come to a range and uh, be run through safety. And that includes a lot of us adults. It's not just anything for children. Uh, many of us never got the proper foundation as an adult. Uh, or somewhere along the way we've forgotten it. But uh, as far as dress goes, that is one option, is to make yourself as visible to another hunter as possible. Also, uh, what's your recommendation on hunting alone or hunting in a group? I think, again, that depends a large degree on the proficiency of the hunter. Um, quite honestly, I hunt mostly alone, uh, or perhaps with one other trusted individual that I am comfortable with hunting with. Um, I think it's a personal decision, most importantly, a person has to be honest with themselves. Uh, are they physically capable of doing so? Um, are they confident enough in the woods? And none of us likes to admit that we're not Daniel Boone. Okay, but the fact is none of us today are. Okay, and there's no shame in going to a class or getting some training through like a hunter ed program or whatnot or sharpening your skills through your local uh, muzzleloading club or your rifle club or your bow club. Uh, and then finding a companion to hunt with, whether it be a family member or something of that nature. Um, it's a personal decision, but you've got to temper it with reality. What can you, are you really capable of in the field? The other area that we want to talk about concerning safety, well, at least uh, one more, and I might even get to a third area. Okay. And that has to do with children, and uh, parents often have to be gone, and the children are, are at home, and there may or may not be a supervisor around, mm -hmm. but there are guns all around. Just take us through the instructions that you give parents of how to create a system where that a, a child would never be killed by a gun. You know, actually, it, it's, uh, that's so simple with the basic things we'll talk about. I hope you know, people will learn from this and enact these uh, basic safeguards. Uh, again, the first thing, realize that you know, leaving guns on around unsupervised uh, can lead to a tragedy, particularly if you have children around. Even if you do not, some other child may visit your home, whatever. The first thing you need to do is talk about securing the firearms. Um, in, the, in the sense of like long guns or hunting guns or whatnot, for the most part, those can be secured away, uh, unloaded, partially dismantled, with the parts kept separately, bolts or magazines separate, that type of thing. That's one option. Where we come into the, the problem, such as we had recently, is defensive firearms, uh, particularly handguns, uh, that most people keep f for that purpose. Number one, unless that firearm is under direct supervision of an adult. It should not be left anywhere. It should not be loaded. Now, if it's going to be loaded, what I recommend is locking it in some manner. What my wife and I use is a lock box. It's a combination box. The guns go in there. All of my other firearms are secured. Uh, our daughter's grown and away and whatnot, but we have a uh, company and, and children visit us and whatnot, relatives and all. All of our other guns, non-defensive guns, are basically secured in a vault, okay? The only two that are left out, and this is an example I give to a couple, uh, are the guns that we use from a defensive uh, standpoint. If they are not in our direct control, and that means if I go out in the backyard gardening or I go in to take a shower, that gun is put in a lockbox and secured, a combination lock. It's still loaded. If an emergency was to arise, uh, say in the middle of the night or whatnot, I can very rapidly access that firearm for defensive posture, yet at other times when it's unsupervised, it is not in reach of unauthorized hands, whether they be children or adult. Uh, there are a number of other options if a person doesn't go that route. 
They can buy locks uh, of a variety of manufacturers commercially available. Uh, even uh, a small combination lock or a key lock can be placed between the trigger and the trigger guard, behind the trigger, on most firearms. This will not work on all of them. And when it's locked, you now have a hasp impeding the movement of the trigger so the gun cannot be fired. Um, police officers for years have used their handcuffs similarly. Lock their handcuffs behind. They could lock the gun then to a leg of a chair or a table and the gun cannot go anywhere and the gun cannot be fired. The officer can very quickly undo it with his key. Um, that's a tip a person could use, either the lock or the cuffs, depending on their situation, uh, law enforcement or civilian. But in essence, they need to be kept uh, secured. If a person is going to have one home and be gone, traveling at work, whatnot, the gun should not be loaded. It will not jump up and defend their home while they're gone any more than the car will jump up and get a quart of milk for them by itself when it's gone. So what purpose do you leave it loaded at home if you're not there in direct control of it? So I'd highly recommend not leaving it loaded and the ammo stored away if that's going to be the scenario. Also, as children are growing up and uh, they're going to be following in the path of maybe like a son of his father hunting or mm -hmm. uh, both the son and daughter to be trained at some age about defense, particularly if they live in, a, in a, uh, an area where there has been a lot of crime. What do you recommend about training children in the safety of guns? When would you start that and I how? long does that process take? I think that's a, to some degree a personal decision as far as the age to start. It depends on the individual child's maturity and their attention span and whatnot. The earlier, the better, in my opinion. And this is including for people who do not even own guns. The very first accident I was ever, uh, uh, or that prompted me to start training, Tony, was as years ago on an accidental shooting. And a young boy had gone to the house next door, got his grandfather's pistol, turned right out of the closet, he goes, here it is, to show his young friend who had no guns in his home and shot him right in the mouth. Unfortunately, this kid survived. But uh, there was an example of this boy not recognizing that this is not good, acceptable behavior, and he could have left. A program right now that's being uh, implemented by the NRA uh, is uh, very similar to what we used to do with blasting caps years ago as a fireman in Florida. And that is if a child, and this is something you can train a child very easily, there is an age where we can start talking and rationalizing and educating. Prior to that, it's basically no, <laughs> uh, don't touch. Their posi NRA's position on this with the Eddie Eagle program is if a child comes in the room or whatever, they come across a gun, it's don't touch, leave the area, tell an adult. And that's something I highly recommend. We used to do that years ago with blasting caps. Kids would come across blasting caps, it was don't touch, leave the area, tell a responsible adult, a policeman, a teacher, a fireman, you know, uh, a parent, whatever. Uh, I would recommend for the young children to educate them in that respect and not to touch and differentiate uh, you know, between guns and toys and whatnot, and not to treat them as toys. As they get older, I would recommend taking them out to a range. Uh, as I mentioned, the group that I just did at the college in Spokane, some of those were non-shooters, some of them were shooters. They went specifically to dispel the myths that their children may have been under. Um, in part, the example a couple of the gentlemen talked about there was because of, for instance, uh, media influence today with like television and movies. We are unfortunately today educating our children, maybe not correctly, but they are watching the movies and the TVs where they all incorrect usage of guns. Pick up a gun, point someone, pull the trigger. We try and counter that with safe use of firearms, and I recommend they go to a training program of that nature. Let the kids go out and experience. Doesn't mean they may ever want to shoot a gun again. They may not even choose to. They may not like the noise. Who knows? But at least they come away with, wow, guns are not like TV. This will destroy. If used incorrectly, this will destroy. Uh, my sibling, my parent, my friend will not get up and be in the next episode like on TV. He will be gone forever. And unless we can instill that and take away this myth around the movies mm -hmm. portray, uh, we're going to continue to have accidents. So part of that training is, uh, we, we think when people are watching television and they're watching fiction that they realize it's fiction, but uh, there are people who don't, especially children. Absolutely. We had an incident not too long ago on, on the squad. We got there, a young child hit with a hammer. When we got there, do you know why he'd been struck with a hammer? It was amazing. His little brother had seen on television, and it was a joking comedy type show, uh, a la Three Stooges. It wasn't that particular thing, but he had seen another person strike another person in the head with a hammer. He went over, this is a younger boy, picked up the hammer, went over, and just drilled his brother in the head with a claw hammer. Now, fortunately, he did not do serious injury. But when we asked him, why did you do that? Oh, I saw it on TV. Unfortunately, they see the same type of thing around firearms, um, and we see that so commonly in my field as far as emergency services, picking up uh, patients and whatnot. 
So unfortunately, we can't all differentiate on what's real and what's not, evidently. As crime has increased in this country, and it unfortunately has over the years, there have been more uh, statistics where there's been break into homes and robberies and murder and so forth. So I know there's an increasing number of people who have turned to firearms as protection in their home. In some of those cases, it's an individual who lives alone, and, mm -hmm. and the increased risk for that person is greater than if there's two or three people there to, to be more protective. And many of them, as they approach this concern, have never been around firearms in their life. And I know you've taken through this training process, mm -hmm. but what do you recommend for them in the types of firearms? Because I know there's a lot of different kinds. Do you have different recommendations to different people depending on where it's? It's really difficult. One of the reasons I set up my beginning level class in such a way that it does not require a person to even own a gun is for this very reason. I commonly will hear, well, um, this individual, and this is particularly true with women, and, um, and that is that they can only handle this or that type of gun. That's probably about the height of sexism, in my opinion, is that somehow they have less brain cells because of their sex, therefore men can handle a certain gun and they cannot. Uh, that's nonsense. Uh, now, from a physical standpoint, all of us, whether it be male or female, may have certain physical limitations that would not permit us to use a specific type of gun. So I cannot make a set recommendation on a type. What I do in my classes is let the person come with whatever gun they have. If they've not bought one, we supply guns, ammo, and everything. We let them shoot a cross-section of guns. Then they have a better idea, and I have a better idea, having met them, what they can handle. Uh, we had a lady a while back that was in her uh, early 80s. Um, she had had, uh, this is some uh, years ago, um, severe arthritis uh, and was not able to hold up much anything larger than a small 22. That's not by any means the optimum gun for defense, but since it was all she could handle, it's what we went with her. Um, to give you a blank, a, a pat answer, Tony, as far yeah, as sure. a, a yay or nay on one or another, it's really difficult because we're all so different. It's like saying, uh, what size is shoe? Sure. Um, from a simplicity standpoint, for many people, a revolver is the most simple. A auto, uh, semi-auto pistol is more complex, but quite often it's easier to shoot for many people. Uh, each will require training and discipline, just as it took a person to learn to drive a car. Well, that, that's true in all fields. Uh, in the field of tennis, we do not recommend a tennis racket to see the size of the hand and how they play and, Absolutely. The, and the, the strength they have. So Absolutely. I wish we had more time. We're out of time. I have the signal that the program has come to conclusion. Bob, I want to thank you on behalf of our staff. My pleasure. This has been most informative and you've been generous with your time. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed our program. I'm sure you have. And we'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at the same time when we will discuss what we believe to be a very important subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.